So hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to our talk uh, on Gizual, which is a uh, visualization for Git's repositories. And it runs uh, purely in the browser. You can find all of the various resources, the slide deck on the uh, Linux Targo website already. So I'm Keith. This is Andreas. And this is Stefan. I'll be starting off and then passing over to the guys. The, the first software repository visualization that I'm aware of was uh, CSoft back in 92. Uh, Steve Ike and his group at AT&T. Back then, they had a source code version management system called ECMS that they were using. And they were able to store per line of code various metrics. So last date, last timestamp of modification, who modified it, that kind of um, statistic. And they came up with this uh, front end, if you like, um, to visualize those statistics called CSoft. A bit like hanging up listings on a wall far away was their metaphor. And each pixel row represented a line of code. And the color coding, the default coding you see here, is age of each line of code with the, the uh, continuous color scale, blue meaning cold, so modified a long time ago, and red meaning hot. And you could also switch to go to a palette where you could see the author, the last author of each line of code. When Git became popular, uh, around 2005, 2006, Git Blame was implemented, which does a similar kind of functionality. It looks through all the commit history, and for each line of code, figures out who was the last uh, person to edit it and when. And Git Blame output is usually a, a textual, so you get a list, something like you see here, uh, with the commits, the name of the, the author, and the timestamp, and then each particular line of code for the current uh, timestamp or version that you're looking at. In 2017, 2018, Johannes Feiner and I worked on a system called RepoViz, which was heavily a back-end sort of server-based. It wasn't really possible then, in the, purely in the front end, to run this kind of uh, visualization or the kind of processing that we needed. So server-side in Ruby uh, with a database and libgit2, which is a C library for accessing Git and, and doing various Git operations. And then with an API and a front end uh, that talked to the back end and then did the visualization for us. And we could do similar things to CSoft. We could also do some full text search, but that was a bit clunky uh, back in the day. So moving uh, to now, a couple of years ago, um, we started the, this project, Gizual, trying to get the same kind of uh, visualization to fit and work purely inside the front end in the web browser. And we're there. It's useful. It's not perfect, as you'll see a, a, a bit later. Uh, but using WebAssembly um, to run libgit2 and using a pool of web workers for efficiency, we're able to, to have a reasonably good uh, repository visualization. Uh, and we don't need a back end, which is a nice thing. OK, so with that, I'm going to hand over. Thank you. So I'm just going to briefly mention how we got started with the project. Um, it all started back in 2022 when we took a course uh, where we were tasked to try out uh, implementing CSoft as sort of a proof of concept inside of the browser sandbox. And for that, we used uh, WebAssembly and back then Mscripten. But we quickly ran into uh, certain issues when working inside of the browser sandbox, which limited our performance. We had frequent UI freezes that the main thread would just freeze up and block. The browser would just kill our application. And the performance was not ideal. But we ended up with a proof of concept after about one and a half months that you can see on this uh, slide, which showed that it was indeed possible to do this kind of visualization inside of the browser. We just needed to improve on the performance to get it to a somewhat reasonable state. And one semester later, we uh, returned to do proof of concept version 2. We used a different rendering engine. We implemented some global state management to help us with certain issues that we had in proof of concept 1. We improved the general UI. We worked a lot to get a little bit closer to the user, to what users would actually need. But we still had performance issues, even after improving a lot. Uh, we were still limited to displaying maximum 50 files. 
and we had very limited support for other browsers like Firefox or Safari. And the entire Blame performance was quite inefficient, which is why afterwards we returned to pursue Gizual again as our master's thesis. And we implemented the entire project architecture again multiple times because we kept <laughs> figuring out better ways to do it. The Git core is still uh, using C and Rust at the bottom, and the entire front-end visualization core was rewritten, which leads us to lot, a lot better performance than we had in the previous proof of concepts. And we also have much more visualization options, and we're now compatible with multiple browsers, and it works on mobile and on PC. So what did we learn from doing it three times? Um, first, creating performant visualizations that have good user experience and look nice is very time consuming, which is why we had to rewrite some of the code multiple times. Also, feature parity in current browsers seems to be like uh, it's perfect already, but it's really a myth at this point. Safari is sometimes even memed to be the new Internet Explorer these days. And we also learned that once you add a bunch of web workers into a complex application, profiling it becomes really difficult. Performance analysis is difficult. Um, so at the bottom, you can see the three screenshots of uh, each of the stages of the project from POC 1 all the way up to the version 1.0 that we are uh, presenting today. So what are the use cases of such a project? First, for developers, it might be very nice that they can see their impact on a big project so they can see who works where and who can help them with a certain feature. Or for project managers just to get an overview of who does what inside of their project, who broke the release maybe, or who they should ask if they want to implement the change. And now I'm going to move to a live showcase of what we've built. Right, this is the first alpha version of, of Gizual. Uh, we present it with a welcome screen. Uh, at the beginning, you can decide if you want to load a local repository or if you want to clone a remote repository. If you choose the local option, we do not upload anything to a server, so it's all entirely processed on your device inside of the browser sandbox. Or you can also just pick a featured repository if you just want to get started quickly. So for this demo, I'm just going to pick local for now and load our own development repository. And after a brief loading period, I'm presented with the canvas at the center. You can see at the bottom that we're still loading some Git uh, file analysis, and now we're done processing it. In the main canvas, you can see, just like it was on CSoft, you can see like all of the files inside of this repository that we have currently selected. Based on the repository that we are visualizing, the pattern TypeScript is automatically applied for us because most of the files in this repo are TypeScript files. So currently you're seeing an overview of all TypeScript files within this repository. The main star of the show is our query editor, or query bar we call it, at the top, where you can select what you want to see. Uh, let me just start by mentioning how selecting dates works. First, you can select a date via the range by date module, is what we call it. Or you could also pick a different module and select a date based on a Git revision, for example, head or main. Um, if you choose the date option, you can pick a start time to visualize and an end time to visualize. And then you also need to pick a branch which you want to see. And if you want to customize this, you can use our timeline, which is an interactive way of selecting time within this repository. Commits are here displayed as circles, and if there are too many commits in close proximity, they automatically merge into ellipses and display the number of commits they contain within a, uh, this box. So I can see all of the commits inside of the main branch in our repository, and if I just want to narrow down my selection to be like the last month or so, I can just pick this slider and drag it with the mouse, release, and now I can see all of the files from this point onward. I can also just move the entire selection around by clicking and dragging, and if I release, the canvas updates automatically. Now you can see at the bottom that some of these lines are colored and some of them are white. This is uh, purposefully done because 
white in our case means these files are outside of your specified range, but we still display their content. It's just the visualization that colors them based on their age is outside of this range. So the next thing you want to do is uh, customize the files you want to see. You do this using our file module. It is default to pattern, and it picks the pattern automatically based on your repository. But you could customize this and say, you, for example, for our repo, you want to see all Rust files. You can just enter a new glob pattern, press Enter, and you now see an overview of all the Rust files in this repository. But if you want to change how they look and how this visualization behaves, you can go to our this dialog, which opens up a new sort of model where you can pick how you want your visualization to look. We default to show you a file, file lines visualization with a full width, but you could also change to see just the lines and not have it scaled up to the entire width of a file. Or you can just um, select a different preset and not see files colored based on gradient by age, but actually see the authors that worked on a file. You can see a list of all the authors down here. And if I just click Apply, the canvas will update again. And now I can see that Stefan, who is colored in orange, it was responsible for writing the Rust code in this repo. If I want to zoom in and see a file he was working at, I can just, I can just scroll in with the mouse wheel. And I can even read the text inside of this box, which is the text of the file at that point in time. But it's a little hard to see, so I might as well change the color. I can do so by opening a standard color picker, hitting accept, and we update automatically. If I want to see even more of that file, I can open it in an inline code editor and even copy contents of it out. Right, so now I know who worked on Rust. I can look at who worked on the CSS, enter the SCSS pattern, and we update again. And now I can see that there are a lot of files uh, written for CSS, which is why the minimap displays that we're only currently seeing the top left of the visualization. I can drag this around to see more. But maybe I want a different kind of visualization to see more at a glance. So I can go back to the Vis dialog, go back to file mosaic, which merges 10 lines into one line and colors them in blocks. I can hit apply again, and the visualization updates. And now I can see all of the files again, but at a much uh, lower scale, and I can see everything at a glance. Right, that was a quick introduction. And with that, I'm going to exit out and hand over to Stefan, who will tell us more about the technical details of how this all works. All right, I'm just going to keep a global overview. I don't want to bore anyone too much. Um, we've set ourselves some goals. As you heard already, the Gishwell runs completely in the browser, which means we don't need a server, which we already don't want to use, because we don't want to upload any kind of data so that even developers working on closed source repositories can use our tool. Of course, we also want things to be fast and quick to, to load, and if that's not possible, load incrementally. And we, just, we don't just want to um, visualize repositor repositories that are small, but also pretty large ones. I've picked a few just for reference. Um, re repositories come in very different sizes. The Linux repository from the Linux kernel has five gigabytes in size. Unfortunately, this just crashes the browser every time I'm trying it, so I'm still working on that. Um, but for desktop uh, hardware, we are already able to visualize uh, repositories like VS Code, which is about one gigabyte in size. For mobile devices, we're still struggling because of memory limitations, but we're also still working on that. But what is it actually that we want to look at? So each repository has a .git folder. It's usually hidden, but it contains all the history of the repository. But how do you actually access this directory in the browser. Usually there's a file input, which usually is designed for a single file, maybe multiple selection, but not for a whole directory. So we've looked up the documentation of the browsers, and we found the file system API. This is essentially just an interface 
It is an abstraction of a file system, mostly async. And there are two implementations currently. There's the file system access API, which is exactly what we would need, because we can ask the user to select the folder, and then we receive a, a file descriptor, so to say, and then we can interact with that and load our data. Unfortunately, this is just supported in Chromium-based browsers, so Chrome and Edge. And there's a second implementation, which is the origin private file system. It, it shares the same interface, but it's a sandbox file system. So we cannot select a local file or folder from the user's directories, but just access a file system that we can write and read from. And this is supported for Chromium, Firefox, and Safari. But we wanted to target all of them, so we've had to come up with some workarounds. As you can see, all the main browsers um, are supported, but, on, but only very recent ones, so Chromium since 2022, and Safari since last year. Uh, for Chromium, we can just use this new file system access API, and we don't even have to store any data in the browser sandbox itself. For Firefox, we need to work around this by using the drag and drop API, so essentially the user should grab the directory and drag it into the browser, then we copy it into the origin private file system, because this will not live in the RAM where it would crash, but rather again on the file system, but at the, in the sandbox one. For Safari, we'd like to do the same, but while they claim they implemented the same origin private file system, they missed one function. And we are still looking for a workaround to make this happen. For mobile browsers on iOS and Android, there is no reasonable way for, to explore a local repository, but for testing purposes, we can use the remote clone, so a server site that clones it for us and then streams all the data of the Git history into the browser, and then the actual processing of the data is again happening in the browser sandbox. Once we have all the data in the browser, we then uh, need to explore it, and again, we are using libgit2 for that. That's a portable POC implementation of the Git core methods. Luckily, there were already some efforts to compile libgit2 for WebAssembly. We couldn't use this directly, but it was a great inspiration to see how we can get things working. But as soon as we compiled WebAssembly, uh, we compiled libgit2 to WebAssembly, we've noticed some performance discrepancies. So everyone is maybe aware of the git command line tool. If you do a blame of a single file in a repository like view, seen in blue, or uh, react, here seen in orange, uh, the git command line tool is very efficient at doing these blames, even for large repositories. In libgit2, a native build, it's already five times slower. And if we compile libgit2 with WebAssembly and run it in a web worker, it's about eight times as slow as the git command line tool. Now, imagine we blame a file in the React repository, or maybe we blame 500 files in the React repository, and each takes a very long time. We can't make the user wait for that. So we've had to come up with another solution. We've introduced uh, pools of web workers for different purposes. Uh, one pool is designed for the git exploration part, and the other one is designed for the rendering and creating the images. Uh, both of them are administered via a single web worker, we call him Maestro. He's responsible for all the state management, uh, the uh, selection of files and everything. And then he reports back to the main view, which is essentially just a view. So our kind of front end, if we uh, skip the usual front and back end uh, naming. Um, and we would like to keep as much as possible of the, of the work that we do off the main thread so that it doesn't lag or uh, feel clunky to the user. Now, that's all from the technical side. Uh, what's next for our project? There are still some things that we'd really like to do, um, so like more visualizations, an SVG export, the git blame within the editor view. We'd also like to increase the usability and make things more easy for new, new users. 
So we would like to introduce a query assistant. And um, we'd also like to introduce a line of code tooltip so that we can explore the code even better. But there's more. Now that we have Git in the browser, we can also run global statistics. We'd like to show commit activity, code additions and deletions. We'd also like to explore the abilities of a native build, uh, which may increase performance dramatically. There's also a lot of documentation that needs to be done, test coverage, and code cleanup in general. Lastly, if anyone is interested, there are upcoming events at the local meetup groups of GrazJS and CSS in Graz for both the UI and the technical stuff, if anyone is interested. And also, we're really looking for developers and project managers on open source projects for alpha testers so that we can learn more about how a user interacts with the system and what we can do better. If you're interested, speak to us after the talk or email us at hello at gizu.com. And with that, thank you for your attention and we're happy to answer any questions. Go back to the first slide and mention what is open source and where the links are, because I forgot. Yeah. So this project is open source. Uh, since are, yesterday. Since yesterday. We are, <laughs> if anyone is interested to work on it, but we will probably change something, uh, a lot of things before it's available for external contribution. Questions? Is there, uh, is there a mic coming? I think the mic is coming. Yeah, okay. Um, regarding no, wait, wait for the mic, for the video, the recording. Yeah, just, just talk, I think it's on. Regarding uh, reading uh, of Git repository content, um, I don't know if, if you heard of it. There is a Rust project called GitOxide. Um, yeah. Did you investigate this, if it fits for your use case? It would fit because Rust compiles nicely to WebAssembly, but unfortunately the, the blame algorithm is not yet implemented and we need the blaming information and we didn't want to implement it ourselves. Okay. So as soon as it uh, implements the blame, uh, algorithm, we'll probably have a look at it if it works out. Okay, thanks. Um, in your previous example, you showed filtering by files. Um, do you guess right that you can also filter for two kind of files, for example, header and source files? Uh, yeah, the... Uh, is it still open? Uh, you just select uh, files based on a glob pattern usually, so .h or .c files. Um, you can also uh, select f files with, with by file picker or a change in revision. revision. Yeah, but, but multiple at the same time, multiple types? Ah, oh, perfect, thanks. Yeah. Is it already possible to write to the DOM or draw things on the screen from WebAssembly, or do you still have to use some clunky JavaScript bridge? Um, it would so directly access to to the DOM um, is usually hard from WebAssembly, especially because WebAssembly is usually run sequentially, and it would block the main thread, and we really don't want things to lag, which is why we've packed everything up in web workers, and web workers cannot access the DOM directly. Um, if we go the, the way of um, generating images, for example, in Rust, and then just uh, storing it as a blob file and sharing it with the front end, it would maybe work. There's the off-screen canvas that may be useful for this. So you can generate an image in the web worker and then use it in the front end. Um, I've not uh, used Rust for any kind of DOM manipulation directly. So all you do here is basically draw to a canvas? 
Yes. Okay, so uh, it's at Gizual. The the app to try out uh, and everything else is linked from gizual.com and it's at github.com slash gizual. And we'd welcome any alpha testers if you're interested in trying it out for us on your own repository. Thank you.